And then a little talk from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our and he will hear my cry and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel roll out your heart on the heavens and you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my past ain't drear without a ray of cheer. And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. Well, a mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies. But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Oh, and let us have a little talk with Jesus. And let us tell him all about our troubles. And he will hear our cry. And he will answer by and by. And you will find with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, might be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Oh, now let us have a little talk with Jesus. And let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our my cry. And he will answer by him. Oh, when you feel a prayer for your Oh, as your heart of heaven is turned. And you will find it. Jesus well, makes it, right. makes it right. Don't you know it's all right? It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Well, now just, just a little talk with Jesus, Jesus makes, makes it, right. it right. Don't you know it's all right? It's all right. Well, it's all right. It's all right. Well, now just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus And let us tell him all about it Cause he will hear my cry And he will answer by and by What we do feel Oh, as your heart of the heaven is turned And you will find With Jesus makes it right It makes it right Amen. Amen. Al, I don't want you to sit down yet. He always does a good job, but he got the grits and gravy out of that song this morning. And I want you to sing Mansion, Robe, and Crown in light of the fact that you are digging a little deeper than usual. Amen. In light of the fact of the lesson. Y'all ready to hear Mansion, Robe, and a Crown? You don't sound like you're ready. Stand up on your feet as we listen to Mansion, Robe, and a Crown. I'm gonna tread my earthly home for better, one bright and fair. For I've left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears no sorrows can be found. When I receive, I want to roll. Let's talk about a mansion. I want a brand new mansion. For the sunshine is ever bright, I need no heavy garment. 
garments. I'll just wrap my robe around. When I receive, well, I want to roll. Let's talk about a match. I want to imagine and a roll back. Try to do, but, but one day I'll be rewarded with a crown so bright and new. I wear a smile so bright, cause there'll be no cause for a crown. Wagging I receive, well, I want to roll. Smile and say amen. amen. Let us say amen again. Amen. Thank you so much, Al, for cooperating in that way. I guess he could say no. It wouldn't look good, but I guess he could have said no. <laughs> we appreciate you so very much, brother, and for all of the brethren who serve at this congregation and for all of the sisters who serve in their own way. We really could not do what we do as leaders without those of you who are willing to follow us, but not us. But as the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. As leaders, we have an accountability. And the accountability is primarily to the Lord, but then secondarily to those who would follow the Lord. It is good to see y'all. And Al is right, there's a, lot, there's a lot more smiling going on today than usual. Is, is there a game going on or a barbecue somewhere that I don't know about? A whole lot of smiling going on. God bless you. Be finding, if you will, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be reading from verse 1 through 4, and that will be the basis of our lesson. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't, say wait. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Holy Spirit says through Paul, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek those things that are above. For Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. How many times have we seen that on television commercials? But wait, there's more. From dustpans to pots and pans, from you name it, from a, a candy to a new kind of knife, we hear that expression over and over again. But wait, there's more. And do you not know that that is sort of what characterizes the book of Colossians, that attitude of, but wait, there's more. We see it in chapter 1 as there are a group of what we would call pagan mystics who believe that Jesus wasn't enough. You actually needed angels in between Jesus and then angels in between those angels to reach God. But wait, there's more. You see it in chapter 2 when we find out that you not only have Jewish um, uh, mysticism along with this paganism, but you have something else going on. But wait, there's more. And it shouldn't surprise us that they were looking for more because sometimes we are looking for more as well. But wait, 
there's more. You see it in our relationships, don't you? You see it in a husband who after 30 years of marriage decides that he's going to leave his wife, trade her in for a younger model, but wait, there's more. You see it in a young mother who somehow feels that it's more important to party than to make sure that her baby is safe from a locked hot car in the sun. But wait, there's more. You see it in a church where there's a range of members who decide whether they're going to go to church that day, whether they feel like it or whether the weather's not too hot. They're going to decide whether they're going to serve God or not on a whim. But wait, there's more. And somehow through the ages, down the streams of time, and particularly in the book of Colossians, he wants us to understand, Paul does, that Jesus is enough. Not Jesus plus anything. Not Jesus minus anything. Not Jesus plus your programs, perspectives. Jesus in of and by himself is enough. Are we a but wait, there's more kind of people? Are we a people who in our personal spiritual life or in our past life of this great congregation say, well, well all of the, the glory days are gone. Those were the more days. These are the less days. And I hear Paul saying to us, the glory days are what God says the glory days are going to be. Do you not know that the, the city of Colossae began as a, as a wonderful kind of city? Long, long before Paul came along, Colossae was an up-and-coming city. Anything you wanted to do, anything you wanted to buy, you could buy in the city of Colossae. And also, it was a multicultural city. It was a politically correct city. Almost every kind of race you wanted to see, you would see in Colossae. But that up-and-coming city, like a lot of our up-and-coming cities, eventually became a down-and-out city. And yet you still had these group of people, primarily the pagan mystics and the Jewish legalists, who says, I don't really understand what you're saying about this Jesus business. All I want is what I want. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you really willing and able to understand that there is something that we have to do if we're going to be what God wants us to be? Y'all don't hear me. There may be some things I want to do. I, I, I may want to see the balcony full. I, I may want to see uh, more programs, and, and those things are good things, but there are some things that I have to do if I'm going to be able to rise to the level that God wants me to rise to. Whether you're talking about your individual spiritual life or collective spiritual life of this congregation, there are some things we must do. And interestingly enough, this text gives us a hint about it. I find it extraordinary that when you look at Romans or Galatians or Colossians, that over and over again what the people of God, that is Christians, should already know. Paul is reminding them, reminding them that they need to know it again. You figure they would have already understood the resurrection and baptism and crucifixion, but over and over again Paul returns those themes because often we're, we don't know what we think we know about Jesus. And in this text, at the end of a discussion about Jesus being better than my legalism, what do you mean by legalism, preacher? Jesus is better than any law I can come up with. And I can come up with a lot of rules. Wives, don't your husbands come up with a lot of rules? Husbands, y'all kind of shy. Are you scared? Uh, husbands, don't your wives come up with a lot of rules? No Oreo cookies after 9 p.m., amen? So come up with a lot of rules, but, 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 but the reality is there is no rule that I can codify. There is no rule that I can calculate that transcends that rule that says love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because I can get a lot of mileage out of love. You won't have to worry about me treating people right because of love. But then some of us, some of us are not legalists, some of us are mystics. 
We seem to think somehow, Brother Daniels, that we could come up with a message that is better than this message, the message of the cross. There is no better message than the gospel message. I hear Paul saying in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. There is no message more powerful than that message. But it's not only a powerful message. This message is a transformative message. And there are no two words that are more transformative. There are no two words that are more revolutionary. And dare I say there are no two words more militant than these two words. Rise up. Rise up. Why isn't the church going where it needs to go? It's because we have forgotten how to rise up. Why is it that we're not loving the way we need to love? Why is it that we're not attracting young people the way we need to attract young people? It's because we don't know how to rise up. And somewhere in this text, Paul tells us that you can make up all the rules you want. You can consult all the horoscopes you feel like consulting. You can talk to everybody from Oprah to Dr. Phil and back to Dr. Phil and go back in time and find Sally J Jesse Raphael if you want. The reality is what I have told you is what you need to seek. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes from the topic, rise up, rise up. And just like a diamond, this text will transform and transmogrify our minds in such a way that if we get a hold of just a little bit, just a taste of what Jesus is saying here, you're going to see a change in your life and the life of the church. All you need is a taste. I, I, I'm a weakling when it comes to peppers. Uh, some of y'all can t uh, eat jalapeno peppers by the dozens, uh, but I just need a little taste to make my fish taste good. And so it is with this, all you need is a taste. You do not need to get everything in this text. But the first thing we need to know about rising up is this. Rising up, we must rise up with a heavenly aim. Rise up with a heavenly aim. Notice verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, we are rising up with a heavenly aim. Can I come down and talk to you? The first thing you have to know about rising up with a heavenly aim is this. This heavenly aim starts with a common position. You have been raised with Christ. And I, I think every now and then we don't realize the importance and the import of that notion, been raised with Christ. What are you saying? It's a common position because we've all started at the same place. I don't care, uh, and, and by the way, for those of you who are listening, this is the plan of salvation. I'm giving it to you at the beginning. I hope that doesn't disturb anybody. The, 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 the common position we started with is, can be found in Romans chapter 6. What are you saying? When he says we have been risen with Christ, he is speaking of something that is a past result. Somebody says, Brother Holmes, some translations will say, uh, if you've been risen with Christ. That's not the correct translation. It's not if you've been risen with Christ, because he's writing to Colossian Christians, folks who have already obeyed the unadulterated gospel of Christ. He's saying, since you've been risen with Christ. Y'all look at me funny. Uh, since you have been married, David, you better make sure you do at least half of what your wife wants you to do. Since you've been risen with Christ. I, I, I like this because the phrase risen here actually comes from a phrase to be co-resurrected. Y'all need to let that marinate a little bit. We have been co-resurrected with Jesus. Am I right about it? Jesus was raised by the power of God. And here's where the plan of salvation comes in. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall she say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are dead in sin live any longer then? What know you not that as many of you have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ? We are buried, therefore, in baptism. That is like Christ was buried in it, so we can be risen from the dead just like him. We rise to the newness of life. Once upon a time, I was a sinner. Yeah, uh, yeah somebody said, Brother Holmes, you're still a sinner, but, but hopefully, Orlando, I sin less. Yeah. 
I, I'm not sinless, but hopefully I sin less. Am I right about it? But once upon a time, I had all my sins upon me. Once upon a time, I was in a position where I couldn't save myself. Once upon a time, I was beside myself in sin and inside myself with wickedness, but Jesus came along. Am I right about it? And I listened to him, and I was buried, not sprinkled or poured, but I was buried in baptism. And just like him, I got up. I got up on a Sunday morning. And all of those things that I've ever done were washed away. And that's the good news of the gospel. So it doesn't matter what money you have or don't have. It doesn't matter what education you have or don't have. The, part, part, the thing you have to understand if you're going to rise up with a heavenly A is that we all start at a common position. Am I right about it? You miss your time to shout. We start at a common place. You have been saved. Somebody said, Brother Holmes, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with my children. But you have been saved. Somebody says, I, I, I'm struggling with my finances. But understand this, you have been saved. You have risen up. But not only is rising up, uh, not only is rising up with that heavenly aim about starting with a common position, but it's also a common purpose. He not only says, if you've been risen with Christ, he says, now nah, you need to do some seeking. Am I right about it? He says, you need to seek those things that are above. Oh, I wish I had time, Brother Hawkins, to talk about this word seek. The word seek originally referred to philosophical inquiry. And before y'all get stuffy and, and look down on that notion of philosophical inquiry, you need to understand what the ancient philosophers did. The ancient philosophers, Brother Hawkins, didn't just sit down in a seat and hear a lecture. But the ancient philosophers were a part of a tradition called parapateo. That means they got up and they walked around. They got up and they walked around. If they want to learn about the nature of trees, they walked up and they saw a tree. Uh, if they wanted to know about why the one fish swims one way and another fish swims another way, they got up and they walked around. Philosophical inquiry then was about walking around. This seeking, if you don't like that example, listen to this one. This seeking is about pursuing. It's about the journey. It's not about the destination. Am I right about it? I, I, I don't know about you, but even though I sin less, I'm not sinless. But I have better news now, Blair, than I used to have. Before I obeyed the gospel, I was not cleansed from my sin, and I had to obey the gospel. But now that I've obeyed the gospel, I can celebrate in fellowship with you sinners. I mean, y'all too. Because you all are not sinless, but you sin less as well. Am I right about it? And notice what happens to me now. I had to be born again of the water of the Spirit, John chapter 3. But now that I have been born again, if you blink, you'll miss this. There's a new message. That message comes from 1 John chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But, thank God for the but. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship. Somebody said, what is fellowship? There are two fellows in the ship. Two fellas rowing in a ship. We're trying to get the same place at the same time, so we got to be two fellas rowing in a ship. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that right? And, and, and that's why we're seeking him. We're not seeking him because we're trying to sound smart. We're not seeking him because we're trying to look down on groups that we say don't follow the scriptures like they need to. But we're going after Jesus just like a hunter goes after his prey. Just like a fisherman goes after his fish. That's how we are seeking Jesus. And there's something interesting about this word seeking. Uh, tell me about it. Okay, let me tell you about it. This word for seek, you see other places in scriptures that you recognize. This seeking is a priority setting seeking. This seeking 
It is a prize finding seeking. Uh, this seeking is a putting Jesus before anything else. Tell me about this seeking. Well, the scripture can tell you. Matthew chapter 7. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Somebody says, how come I haven't found Jesus? My answer would be, you're not seeking him. You see, finding Jesus, sisters, is like finding the right kind of man. I wish I had a church to preach to. You can't go to the wrong place and try to find the right man. Well, 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 I'm going to change him, all right? Let me give you a big news flash. Uh, if the Lord hasn't changed him, you're not going to change that joker either. So why are you calling him a joker? I could call him something else, but yeah, we're Christians here. So this is, this is a priority kind of find. Seek and ye shall find, but not, not only that. This is a prize finding kind of finding. Am I right about it? Matthew chapter 13, so somewhere around verse 45, it says, the kingdom of heaven is, is like someone who's looking for a great pearl. We're not talking about a zirconia. It's like somebody looking for a great pearl. We're not just talking about any old kind of pearl, but we're talking about that pearl of great price. How valuable is Jesus to you? You're seeking him in priority. You're seeking him and asking for him, but then there's, I'll give you one still. Is finding Jesus more important than living with your anxieties? There's another place where this word for seek is shown. We've already sh said it's shown and ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall be found. We've already shown that it's shown in, in, in the uh, 13th chapter of the book of Matthew, but there's another place you need to look at it. And that's Matthew chapter 6. You remember what Jesus said to a group of poor people with no supermarket, don't worry about food. Do you remember when Jesus said to a group of people who didn't know about construction companies or Section 8, uh, don't worry uh, about a place to stay. Do, do you remember when Jesus said to a, a group of people who didn't know anything about thrift stores or clothing stores of any kind? He said, don't worry about what you'll eat. Don't worry about what you drink. Don't worry about what you're going to put on. But seek, but seek, but seek, but seek, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. See how God's going to rule you and everything is going to be added unto you. And I wish I had a witness this morning when you didn't have enough money, you sought God anyway. When you didn't feel well, you sought God anyway. Uh, when, 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 when the debts were high and the funds were low, you will have enough audacity to say, I'm going to seek Jesus. Folk talking about you and you were seeking Jesus. Elders and deacons and preachers weren't listening to you, but you were seeking Jesus. Everything and everybody seemed against you, but you were seeking Jesus. Now he talks about that, that common purpose the common position is that resurrected position. The common purpose is that we're seeking those things which are above. But if we have a, a, a common position, if we have a, a common starting point, we also need to know we have a common place. My end game is heaven. I, I've said this to every congregation I preach for. I'm going to preach, try to preach y'all into heaven. Every one of you. But if you don't want to go, I plan on making it a solo trip. <laughs> Heaven is my end game. Yes, I'd, li I'd like to preach to a congregation that shout a little bit. All preachers like that. I don't know a, a preacher, including preachers at quieter congregations, who don't like people to say amen a little bit. But heaven is my end game. And you know why heaven is my end game? Because I know as wonderful as it is down here, heaven's going to be better. Yeah. Isn't that what Jesus said? You remember John chapter 14 when the disciples were a little bit worried about Jesus leaving. And, and I understand them being worried about Jesus leaving. Because if I had hung out, y'all don't hear me. If I had hung out with Jesus, I would be nervous about him leaving too. You might want somebody to go including neighbors, who's, uh, friends and family who have stayed too long. You might want somebody to leave. 
But if you want Jesus was with Jesus, you want, want him to be there all the time. Jesus was getting ready to leave. And even though Jesus could feed them bread without a bakery, even though Jesus could give them water without a well, even though Jesus could be that way out of no way, Jesus said to them, yes, I'm going away. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is my end game. I may not get a mansion down here, but I'm going to get a mansion up there. And that mansion, you don't have to worry about rent control. Am I right about that? In that mansion, you don't have to worry about what the 1% will be able to glean and the rest of us won't be able to glean. In that mansion, you won't have to worry about gardeners or landscapers or painting. In that mansion, that's where I'm trying to go. He says, I want you to understand when you rise up, you rise up with a heavenly aim. I have a question for you this morning. What are you aiming for? What are you aiming for? Well, I, I want Figueroa to go back to her glory days. Some of the things we probably want to revisit from those glory days. But that shouldn't be your aim. Well, I, my goal is to, to renovate the building in such a way that it reflects the liveliness and light of the 21st century. Yeah, that's a good goal. But that shouldn't be your aim. My aim is that every Christian at the Figueroa Church of Christ should act like they have some sense. That's definitely not going to happen. It's never going to happen. But each one of us can have a heavenly aim. Why? Because we're rising up. Why? Because we're rising up and it's not on our own power. And notice what we're rising up to. Can you see it? We're rising up to Christ who's on the right hand of God. If I had to talk, talk about the right hand, right hand is a place of privilege. Am I right about it? In, in the right hand, you can get some things done. You've heard the expression right hand man on the right hand. You get some things done. And the Bible says that Jesus is on the right hand of God, which means he can get some stuff done. Right hand is a place of privilege but the right hand is also a place of power. That's why I hear Jesus say right after he's resurrected in Matthew chapter 28, all power, not some power, all power, not presidential power, all power, not governmental power, all power, not earthly king power, all power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And anybody who wants to stand against me, you might get over for a little while but eventually I'll rise up. You might lie on me on my job. You might lie to me to my friends and family, but I'll rise up. I'll rise up because that's the kind of God I'll serve. Some of you can testify about how somebody was trying to mess you up at work, but God helped you to rise up. Somebody tried to defame your name, but you didn't have to speak for yourself. I can't speak for myself as well as God can speak for me. Yeah. Boldly say, that that's why the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 14, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I'm not going to fear what folks will do unto me. So we have to rise up. Somebody say rise up. Rise up. We have to rise up to, to, to that heavenly aim. But we have to also rise up to a Heavenly attitude. Heavenly aim. A heaven word attitude. Heavenly aim. Heaven word attitude. Some of your translations will say in chapter 3, verse 2, set your affections on things above. Some of them will say, set your minds. Set your minds on things above. Uh, it, it, it would be instructive for us at this point to try to figure out to try to unpack, to try to think through the difference between seeking and setting. Ah, uh, seeking is about the outward. Am I right about it? Setting is about the inward. Ah, uh, uh, seeking 
is about action. Setting is about attitude. And you can have the right action and the wrong attitude. You know, good and well, some of y'all drug yourself to church talking about Holmes is preaching. Because Holmes will preach, you say, some of us, I don't want to rise up because he's preaching. But now watch this. Seeking is different from setting because even though the seeking he's talking about in verse 1, somebody say verse 1. It, it, it's not really about uh, this, uh, this going through the motions. It can become that. It happens in any relationship. We get to the point where there's a disconnect. Somebody say disconnect between the inward and the outward. Once upon a time, your husband brought you flowers and he meant it. But now he's just going through the motions. Once upon a time, you sang loudly and boldly in the service and you meant it. But now you're going through the motions. Once upon a time, you ushered or you read scripture or you did whatever it was you did with passion, but that passion is gone. And where has the passion gone? He says, you're not setting your affections on things above. Now, I want you to stay with me for a minute. Uh, verse 2. Again, some of your translations will say, set your affections. Some will say, set your minds. When we think affection... We think the heart, and when we think mind, we think the head. In the ancient world, there was not a separation between head and heart. In the ancient world, there was this connection with head and heart. In the ancient world, head and heart went together like peanut butter and jelly. Head and heart went together like beans and cornbread. Head and heart went together like biscuits and gravy. Head and heart were together. Let me, let me ha have you get at it another way. What, what, once upon a time, husbands, before you were married to the woman who became your wife, and wives, before you were married to the man who became your husband, you the first thing you did was you saw him. Am I right about it? Ah, uh, husbands, you saw your intended's beauty. I remember years ago at the Normandy Church of Christ, it was a Sunday evening service. And I can confess this now because we've been married a long time. I saw this young woman walk across it was daylight saving time I saw her walk across the front lawn on the Normandy Church of Christ and, and, and the first thing I saw was her legs and even back then I was preaching but I said to myself not so anybody else could hear it my 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 you, you got to love the Lord for creating someone like that That's usually how, how men initially notice, right? Now, we'll say that women don't initially notice that way. Now, I know sometimes y'all deeper, but you start with the eyes. You start with the emotions. And, you know, I, I can imagine what some of you sisters say. You saw that guy for the first time, and you say, he sure is tall. <laughs> he sure got nice biceps. He can lift my grocery bags anytime, right? <laughs> Isn't that right? But that's where you started. But if you develop that kind of heart relationship, stay with me. If you develop that kind of heart relationship, you did not develop a meaningful relationship until you also put the head in it. You looked at that beautiful woman and you also started to think about what kind of wife she would be, what kind of mother she would be, what kind of character she would have. There was a bridge between emotion and thinking. And why can't we see the same thing when it comes to setting our affections on things above? 
You have to think your way and feel your way through this struggle we have along life. We have to be able to, to, to understand that when we're talking about setting our affections on things above, it comes from a word that actually means practical wisdom. Not just wisdom, but practical wisdom. Everything God gives us can help us there, but we won't get there on our own. What do you mean? I mean when we talk about practical wisdom here, we are not talking about education. Ah, but you might want to read the Bible more closely than you usually do. You might want to read it as closely as you do your insurance forms or your racetrack forms or your lotto forms. You need to read it closely. But it's not about education. Yes, it's important to have experience because the more we experience God, the more we can say, taste and see that the Lord is good. I wish I had a witness here who could talk about experience that they had with God, that they could taste and see that the Lord was good. It's not about your education. It's not about your experience. It's not even about your economic status. Even though we should be able to give as we prosper. What are you saying, Brother Holmes? I'm saying there's some educated fools, there's some rich fools, and there's some old. And we're all that way when we don't set our affections on things above. We got to understand that we have a God who's a God of the heart and mind. Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all of thy heart, with all of thy mind and all of thy strength, everything that you have. You need to love God. But we not only must figure out this difference, we must face we must face a certain reality when it comes to seeking those things that are above. We have to be able uh, to, to know that we are not talking about ignoring the earth or ignoring what's going on in our planet. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that Paul is calling us to understand that when we rise up, we are not just rising up to focus on heaven so that we forget about the earth. You can't forget about what's going on here. We live in a crazy world. And where is the church? Where, where is the church when it comes to babies who are separated from their moms and dads? I'm, I'm not trying to be political here, but you need to have a position. Where is, is the church when it comes to people who are hungry? Where is the church when it comes to people who are on the margins? What kind of society do we live in when somebody can work 40 day, 40 hours a day, uh, or rather 40 hours a week, and, and, and still, and still live up outdoors. What kind of world do we live in? And we need to have a voice. Someone says, I don't understand that. That still sounds political to me, David. Well, let me take you to the book of Micah, where Micah says, and he has shown thee, O Lord, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. Anytime there is trouble, I should be concerned about it. Jesus fed people before he taught people. Hungry man can't listen to what you say about the gospel. And even though our end game, our priority is teaching the gospel, we got to still make sure that we're serving people. Set your affections on things above. I want to ask you this morning, are you setting your affections on things above? Are you, are, are you looking at that Lord the way you need to look at him? But what are your affections tied to? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6 that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What do you treasure? Some of you treasure King James coming. And I'm not talking about the King James Bible. Some of y'all think that, we, that that's going to solve all your problems. You're going to be so happy to go to a game that the Lakers actually win. And, and, and what you have to understand is, as good as LeBron James is, that ain't going to help the Lakers one bit. 
Set your affections on things above. We got to rise up. We got to rise up with that heavenly attitude. We got to rise up with that heaven word attitude. What's your attitude? Do you have a smacking attitude? Y'all know what a smacking attitude is. Do, do you have a three snaps in a circle attitude? What, what, what's your attitude? Do you have a talk to the hand attitude? You know, there's a lot of things we can do without trying to do them. And our shepherds and leaders here, I think they get that. They have a, our shepherds have this desire to shepherd the people. They have a desire to quote Lynn Anderson, to smell like sheep. And they know that our attitudes are not right. What is your attitude this morning? What is your attitude about studying God's word? What is your attitude about serving God? What is your attitude? I, I'm, I'm trying to say that if your attitude is a downward looking attitude, there's no way you're going to look up. There's no way I'm going to look up by looking down. But not only does he talk about that heavenly aim, not only does he talk about that heaven word attitude, but then lastly he talks about the holy advocate. Isn't that right? We have an advocate that gives us power. I lost power this morning. I call myself trying to cook something in the crock pot, but instead of putting the food in the clay part, I, I, I put it in the canister part that holds the clay pot. Try to clean it out and cover it up. had nerve enough to actually end up putting the food in the clay part, didn't put it back where it's supposed to be, and wondering why it won't come up. The power was gone. And the power was gone because of what I did. If God is away from you, if God is distant from you, who moved? Lord said, I will always be with you and I won't forsake you. So I ask you again, if God is not close to you, then who moved? Uh, he, he says uh, that I'll be better than a brother. I'm the alpha and the omega. And I said, and I said again, if God is not close to you, who moved? This is why Paul, this is why Paul seeks to know Christ. You see, that was the problem in Colossae. They, they thought, Brother Daniels, that they could figure out a way through astrology or through legalism to know God. And, and don't look at them funny. Some of y'all read your uh, horoscope before you got here. Don't angle God. Don't con God. Do what he says. And Paul learned that the hard way. Am I right about it? Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3 and Acts chapter 22, that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, educated under the great Gamal. He also was a Roman citizen. That means he knew a lot and he knew his rights. And we spend more time as Christian talking about our rights than embracing our responsibilities. But watch Paul, will you watch him? It wasn't his Jewish education that he celebrated. It, it wasn't his Roman citizenship that he celebrated. But he lets us know in Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse number 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his rising. I, I know that there is power that comes from electricity, but I want to know Christ. I, I know there's power that comes from various sources in our online age, but I want to know Christ because that power will change a bad marriage into a good marriage. That power will change a cursing man into a praising man. That power will change a gossiping wife to one who glorifies God. That power will change a lazy Christian into a hard-working Christian. That power will make deacons do what they're supposed to do, will make elders do what they're supposed to do, will make preachers do what they're supposed to do. That power 
And I have to tell you anything that I am not doing, anything that I am not handling, whether it's in my job or in my family or in church, is because I'm not tapping in to the power. You, you know, when I messed up that, 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 that food this morning, one of the first things I was thinking was, well, maybe I didn't plug it in. Because sometimes I have that problem. Don't look at me funny. Y'all have that problem too. And yet over and over again, we see Christians who have not grown, listen, in 40 years. If you are still in the same place spiritually than you were 40 years, what's the problem? If you, still, if you still think the same way you used to think, if you still do exactly what you used to do, who moved? We have a holy advocate. Real quickly, let's talk about this, this holy advocate. The, the, the Bible lets us know a little bit about this holy advocate. First of all, this holy advocate is the one that we surrender to. Take a look at verse number three. For you have died. You have died. You have died. You have died. Let me let you in on a little secret that will help you illustrate this point that I'm about to make about the importance of us remembering that we have died to the love and practice of sin. For about, and I don't even think Vincent knows this, for about two years, I ate no meat. For about two years, I was a vegetarian. Matter of fact, for a little part of that time, I was vegan. Matter of fact, for a little part of that time, seven months, I was raw vegan. And, and, and one of the things that persuaded me initially was the moral argument. Well, uh, those animals are suffering. And which might be true. But by the time I fry that chicken, yeah. that chicken ain't feeling no pain. By the time I, 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 I cook those ribs, those ribs are feeling no pain. You can slap the chicken and the chicken won't snap back. You can body slam the ribs and the ribs won't turn around and go, whoa. Because they are dead. So I decided I'd rather eat some dead meat than worry about some live chickens. If we have died to the love and practice of the world, you know one of the signs that you know you're growing spiritually is the stuff that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. I'm not talking about being superhuman. I'm not talking about people who don't lose their temper, but the stuff that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. The parties you used to want to go to, you don't need to go there that more. The, the liquor you used to want to drink. Now, 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 what kind of whiskey do they usually drink in bars, brothers? when you decide to, to work with a preacher who's just like a brother to you. Brother Hawkins knows entirely too much about Brother Hawkins. It shouldn't bother you anymore because you have died. You want to know where you need to grow spiritually? Ask yourself where you haven't died. Ask yourself where you haven't died. Brother Holmes, I just have to say, you haven't died with your tongue. Well, Brother Holmes, I, I just, uh, when I'm tempted, I try to be good, but when I, I'm tempted and the person looks just right, I got to get my swerve on. If you want to know what swerve means, ask Brother Hawkins after service. <laughs> You know, I had to get him back, right? You know what you're not dead to by what you respond to. So I, I not only have to have the right kind of attitude or the right kind of aim, I have to make sure that I know who my advocate is. He has died so that I might die. 
Am I right about it? When I was buried with him in baptism, I, I died to the love and practice of sin, and I rose up to walk in the newness of life, but I died to some things. But not only, not only is he one who we have surrendered to, but he sustains us. Notice what the verse says. Your life is hid with Christ. I like that. He sustains us. Now somebody said, how do you get that out of your life is hid with Christ in God? How do you get that out of that, that he sustains us? Well, folks used to bury treasure in the ground. Am I right about it? They didn't have any banks or safes. They used to bury treasure in the ground. Some of y'all are old enough to remember some old folk, who, old folk who used to put money in the mattress and zip it up. And some burglars found out later on that there was money in the mattress. When he says hid, he's saying our lives are concealed, but I don't want you to miss life. Life here is from that word zoe. It means absolute life, life as God has it. It's the kind of life that Jesus said, had talked about when he says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Yes, I know you're having problems as a Christian. Christians get sick. Christians get stepped on. Christians struggle. But I need a witness to say I'm glad that my life is hid with God. Yes, you may be going through a struggle right now with your health. But aren't you glad you're going through that struggle with Jesus? You might be going through a struggle with, with your finances, but aren't you glad you're going through that struggle with Jesus? You might be going through all sorts of struggles, but somehow he's the one that carries and makes it all better. He is the one who sustains us. That's why we boldly say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what men will do unto me. That's why we say the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. In the path of his righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and staff will comfort me. Notice the next thing he says. Thou will pass a table for me in the presence of my enemies. That is the enemies that knock me down. That's the place where you're going to hook me up. And I'm glad about that. And he says, he goes on to say, Thou prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. For the quality of the quality of life. Now we can ready to close now, but you guys, you're not seeing this. You're not seeing how this holy advocate works with us. So, Brother Daniels, I need you to come up forward, please. And, and, and Blair, is your leg okay, Brother Daniels? Your leg's okay, right? All right. Uh, come on up here, uh, Blair. I want you to get this because the, the illustration of hidden is really understood best with pastoral life. The Shepherd helping with the, the sheep, making sure the sheep are protected and provided for us. So I don't want you to miss this. I want you to be goodness, and I want you to be mercy. And when I move, you move just like that. So the Bible says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Can, can we get some mercy over here? Come, 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 come over here. Come on over here. Okay, you, 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 you. okay. Mer he said mercy's okay. We'll get grace next time. Mercy's okay, Orlando. Orlando, he got it. He got it. Sometimes, sometimes unfair things happen to me, but I'm not going to worry about it because goodness and mercy will follow me. Sometimes I get sick and I don't understand why I'm getting sick. I'm doing exactly what the doctor says. But, but, but I'm not going to worry about it because goodness and mercy will follow me. 
uh, so, sometimes I, I struggle with, Lord, how why is it that my prayers are not answered uh, when, when I pray about my children and, and, and what they're doing and what they're not doing? But I'm not going to worry about it because goodness and mercy will follow me. And sometimes, Lord, I su suffer enough internal pain that, that I don't even know if you're there. I suffer enough eternal pain that even with my family around me, church family and human family, I don't know if I'm going to be all right. And in the moment when I doubt you the most, in the moment when you have Christians around you who are no help and sometimes with no help with each other, in the moment when you're just about to throw in the towel, I don't want you to throw in the towel. In the moment you're at the end of your rope, I, I, I don't want you to just leave that rope. In the moment when you think it, it, it's timed out and you've been knocked out, I want you to get up and go. You know why? Because goodness and mercy will follow you. Give these brothers a hand. He, he's still following me. <laughs> rise up. And we'll rise up. In spite of the pain, we'll rise up. In spite of the ache. Isn't that what the song says? And we'll do it a thousand times. But we'll do it not because we're rising up for another person, but because he rose for us. Like the song says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Is your fear gone? Is your fear gone? If you were to die today, would you be ready to meet him? How many of you want to go to heaven? Let me see a show of hands. Keep them up. How many of you want to go today? Rise up. Rise up with the right aim. Rise up with the right attitude. And rise up with the right advocate. Jesus saves. And our message to you is he saved the same way he saved back then. And that message is very simple. That, that message says that he saves us because we have a faith that's animated enough that we're going to change our lives. We have a faith that's animated enough that we're going to say in front of everybody, and we don't care who hears it, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, Has a faith that we actualize, that we realize in the waters of baptism. Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse number 26. For you are all the children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We want to encourage you to come. But tonight, for 15 minutes, we're going to speak from Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to speak from this topic, simply Jesus. All you need is Jesus. Following Jesus is not simple, but all you need is Jesus. Maybe right now you're not experiencing power. There's nothing wrong with being weak. The problem is when you refuse to become strong. This morning there may be someone who, who doesn't feel plugged in. There's, there's no sin in not being plugged in. The sin is not taking advantage and plugging yourself in. Rise up. We're going to ask the song leader to rise up and we're going to ask you to rise up. And I'm going to ask anyone who to respond who needs prayer. If you need prayer to remember the resurrection and the power of the resurrection, even before we start singing, I want you to come. I know that there are some from the front, right to the left who need to experience that power. 
There's some coming, God bless you. There are some from the front to the back who experience that power. If you have a flicker in your spiritual life, if, if somehow your, your spiritual life seems to be on one minute and off another, I want you to come and respond because I don't have all the power, but I know where all the power is. And you need to come to that Lord and get that power. Yes, come on down. Come on down and get the power that comes from him. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. You're coming because you're saying, I need power in my life. I need power as a husband. I need power as a wife. I need power as a son or daughter. I need power as a child. I need that power. And don't get it twisted. He's going to, thank you, God bless you, sister. He, he's going to give that power to anyone and everyone who responds. Aren't you tired of being in the same place, doing the same thing, expecting different results? Yeah. Come get some of this power. This power is free. There's no credit check for this power. I'm supposed to be done preaching. The, the power is free. You won't need a cosigner for this power. This power is free. You won't need anybody to write you a letter of recommendation for this power. This power is free. And somehow, in some way, this power is going to make you a better person. I wish I had a witness. Man. Someone who's become a better person because of this power. You're not sinless but you sin less Amen. because of this power. We want to encourage you to come. Won't you continue to come as we say? God is calling the prodigal, come without delay. Hear, oh, hear him calling, calling now for thee, for thee. Though you wandered so far from his presence, come today. Won't you come? Hear his loving voice calling still. Calling now? Calling now for thee. Calling now for Hear the prodigal come. Oh, weary prodigal come. Weary prodigal come. Weary prodigal come. Calling now for thee. Calling now for thee. I know the time has been well spent, but I have to just make one more appeal. Many of you have probably heard the story about the mother who sent her son away, and she wanted to make sure that he studied the Bible like she taught him to all of those years, and many of us have been disappointed when our children don't do what we taught them to do. And so she says, you need to, to, to read that Bible because everything you need is in that Bible. And this particular young man didn't want to read the Bible like a lot of young people. He went off to college and, and did what he wanted to do. He partied when he wanted to party, went to class when he felt like going to class. And over and over again, his mother would say, just read the Bible. Everything you need is there. And not unlike the prodigal son, he began to spend and waste money. And he called his mom and his mom said, I'm sorry, but everything you need is in the Bible. Around the time when he got pretty desperate, I'm talking cheese and stale crackers, desperate. Mm -hmm. By the time he got desperate, I'm talking about Top Ramen, but not the brand name Top Ramen, desperate. <laughs> Around that time, he started going through the Bible, and he kind of flipped through Genesis, and he saw $20. Mm -hmm. got, got, got somewhere in the minor prophets and saw $50. Mm -hmm. By the time he got to the New Testament, he saw a hundred dollars. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say he had the money all of the time. Yeah. But I have a better story than that. That story is of the spiritual resources you have in Christ. I have a good friend who likes saying this. Don't live beneath your privilege. We have spiritual filet mignon and croissant. <clears throat> And we're going around eating stale hot water cornbread. Yeah. That's where you are right now spiritually. If you haven't completely surrendered yourself to Christ, this is the time. This is the time you listen to him and say, Lord, my life is all messed up. It's all jacked up. I've been knocked down, but I'm not going to stay down. I've been pushed back.
but I'm not going to stay back. I'm going to rise up no yes. matter what's going on in my life. Yes, sir. Because you can get me up even when I don't feel like getting up. Yes, sir. And if you believe that, you need to be one who comes. I, I would to God that anyone who's just thinking about coming, come on down. Maybe you can take someone by the arm and come on down. We must be able to open up to the reality of God's transformation. Won't you come while we say? Come, there's bread in the house of thy father and to spare. He here is going and calling, calling now for thee. He's calling you, won't you come? Lo, the table is spread and the feast is waiting there.